welcome to Lay It Out, the No Bullshit Science Podcast. With Extra Bullshit. I'm Kiri. And I'm Malice. And she's Demelza. Hey! Hey, hey, hey. she just waved. We're on week five of lockdown and nothing's changed, so I guess we have nothing to talk about. I think my life's gotten worse. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us, tell us why, what's wrong? I'm just having an awful week. (laughs) And it's only Wednesday. But it I tried to, huh? You're also, it, the Wednesday also means you're halfway through the working week, so. I know, I know. Um, so me and my housemate yesterday were both having a really bad day. So in the evening, we decided that yesterday was actually Sunday. Today is Monday and it's a three-day week. But you hate Tuesdays and that's tomorrow. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. How did I overlook that? Oh, Christ. And I love Thursdays. This, this is awful. Why did I do this? This is a terrible plan. Anyway, regardless, yesterday was still Tuesday and it was fucking awful. So it's going down in history as the most Tuesday is Tuesday there ever was. Oh, I'm sorry. It's fine. Also, I drank quite a lot of wine. Why do you have to be so different? Like, why can't you be like a normal person where it's like Monday's the worst and it's like the most Mondayest Monday ever? Because Monday is overrated as the worst day of the week <laughs> Tuesday is the underdog it is 100% worse <laughs> at least on a Monday you know you're easing yourself back into it you can kind of give yourself a bit of a break if you had a heavy weekend and be like okay I just need Monday to like clear my head and then I'll get down to the serious work on Tuesday and then mm-hmm. Tuesday hits and you have to get down to the serious work and it's, it's just fucking awful and you're four days away from the weekend you don't even have the excuse of last weekend hangover to take it easy it's the worst day That's bad true. things always happen to me on a tuesday i actually feel like my least favorite day might be a wednesday <laughs> demelza's cat's bomb is in <laughs> our faces which which themes nicely with the topic of today's podcast so speaking of should we inv- introduce our guest now yeah unless you have any news because i feel like i've just talked about myself and my hatred of tuesdays for the last four minutes no, I literally have nothing. Like, I've been in my house, bored, in my house, bored. And that's it. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, to the guests. Okay, uh, so this week we have um, one returner who is closely affiliated with one of us. And then... A repeat we have, offender. We have a, calls herself a fangirl. And mm-hmm. I've been told was once saw me in the pub, but was too scared to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, Star so Shock. We have Dan and Becky. Please have Hello. Hello. Hi. Sure. I'm waving. We're admitting that I was a massive fan girl now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was no way that I was going to not mention that. <laughs> Me and Curie have now both had proud moments. One time I got called Alice from the podcast by one of her friends. <laughs> and Curie has had somebody not speak to her because they're so starstruck. You know, every time you come up in my stories now, he'll reply to them being like, oh my God, it's Alice from the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. <laughs> yeah. How are you both? Good, good. Just been sitting in the sun today, enjoying quarantine as much as possible. Mm-hmm. It was so hot today. It was. Yeah. I, I hear it was like 21 degrees. I didn't realise. I was sitting in bed watching films and eating cold pizza this morning. <gasps> so I only realised at about one o'clock. So oh, I had, had a great day. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, apparently it's going up to like 23 degrees tomorrow. Mm. Yeah, tomorrow's going to be good too. Do you guys reckon this is like what would have happened anyway? Or do you think this weather is a result of there being less people in the world? I think it would have happened anyway. Uh, that's very, that's very grim. Feel like I've said the stupidest thing in the world. Because <laughs> you have. <laughs> so what would you say? That's a very grim way of looking at it. It's like, oh, we've had really great weather because of death. Well, yeah. Not because of the death. Because of like... No, that's like air pollution and stuff as well. Exactly. Well, uh, well, when you say less well, people, it makes it sound like because we lost loads of people. That's true. Can I can I just say I'm really enjoying how sassy Demelza's cat's being. It spent <laughs> the last five minutes stroking her face with its tail. <laughs> and now we can see its asshole again. <laughs> <laughs> this cat is a fame whore. <laughs> To be fair, she was always the one that was inter- interrupting us when we recorded in Demelza's flat. 
Yeah, but we're getting real special treatment now. Like this is this is more than I've ever seen. Look, right, it's stroking her chin. <laughs> so there's no need to introduce Dan. He's been on the podcast. This is now your third time on the podcast. Yep, third time. Pleasure. It's a pleasure every time. Yep, he is my partner and the bane of my life. Um, partner. Of your life. Yeah. yeah. Partner. How old are you? <laughs> okay. Do you know what you're not? I don't know why, but like I just I always say partner. And then, Ew. And then people are like. <laughs> and then I either get. I, I actually one, say soulmate. So. <laughs> and I usually get one of three reactions. I usually get someone being like, like not reacting because that's what they say too, or it's someone being like, yeah, you sound really old, or someone being like, you sound like a lesbian. Yeah. <laughs> oh just, wow. That's what I usually. That's what lesbians usually say. Maybe I should stop saying that. Or just pretend you're a lesbian. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, just be be ambiguous and interesting. Yeah. That's true. That's trendy these days. Leave them guessing. <laughs> keep the um, phone down as they as well. <laughs> You'll confuse everyone. <laughs> I'd actually start throwing up in my mouth if I heard that. <laughs> um, cool. So, Becky, do you want to tell us a little bit about you? So, we don't actually know you at all. I think you're one of our first guests we've had on who we have no, we don't know, right? Ooh. Well, yeah. we've had a few people, I think, who have been brought by other people. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. We have, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Becky. Okay. <laughs> so this part, we normally ask, um, so tell us a bit about yourself. What do you do? Um, and your three most favorite things about lockdown. Okay. That's a very new um, thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm a sales rep for Brewery. Ooh. which means I just walk around all day selling beer to different pubs around London and East London, which is quite fun. And Do I you get, get to drink the beer while you sell it. Well, not that my boss would know about, <laughs> but it is market research. If you do like work from a pub and you're tasting all the beers and building relationships, nice. the samples that come home with me, I think that would be an issue. <laughs> There's a um, but yeah, I live in East London. That's, that's, um, where I am and my three favorite things about lockdown um I started cycling which is good because I don't do any exercise at all no. and I've actually been like, cycling on the roads and stuff um I'm spending less money and I've actually just had time to sit and think about my life which is <laughs> debatable of how much fun it's been <laughs> because... I feel like that last one would be sometimes a good thing sometimes a bad thing yeah. <laughs> um, but... this, is, this is so interesting because the other two are two of my favourite things about lockdown oh, as well good. I was about to say what yeah. are they but I just said them <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I, I started cycling on the roads for the first time as well, and I'm loving it yeah, I've realised though, it's not going to be the same as when everything gets back to normal. I had to come to terms with that yesterday. Listen, no, it's, it's fine. Like, drivers are so scared of hitting you that, well, most of them, that most of the time it's fine. I've only ever, like, nearly died a few times. Oh, oh cool. Um, so, in, in during the course of my recent cycling career, which began at the beginning of lockdown, I've seen like two really bad cyclist um, crashes, I guess you could say. Mm. One of them was on Tower Bridge, and the guy had blood all over his face. Oh. It was terrifying. It, it's a sobering sight, that's what I'll say. It is really scary when you see someone get hit. Yeah. So, the only thing I'm thinking though about. Um, our cycling careers being solely in lockdown is at least we're getting practice. Maybe we will, we will be able to brave the roads. If anything, lockdown might be a more dangerous time to cycle because the roads are empty, so the cars will be driving faster. I've seen some. Um, I've seen some real terrible drivers in the last couple. Any time I've gone out for a run, some of the drivers are just absolutely ridiculous. Maybe you're not a very good runner. Oh, it doesn't affect the cars. They're, not, like... <laughs> they're all just unnerved around you. <laughs> oh, okay. It's because I'm, I, I run with my hands up in the air, that's fine. <laughs> Do you run like family from friends? Exactly like that. Yeah. Yeah, so I was just going to ask, um, we normally now move on to what about your relationship with science? So um, 
did you do any science subjects in school? Did you enjoy them? Did you hate them? Did you blow up any like experiments? And um, do you enjoy any kind of sciencey bits and pieces in your current life? Okay. Um, so in school, I was really awful at science. My dad's from Mauritius which means like he's Asian and he would just like really want me to be really good at science because he wanted me to be a nurse like him and my mum were as well. So like there was always this pressure that I had to be like really, really good at science and I was just so awful at it. Um, and then I was always in the bottom set, which meant that like I never concentrated and I always just got kind of just like chatting with my friends and I just forgot that I was even doing a GCSE in it. I ended up getting a D in science as well. So like really nothing good on paper. Then I was um, a teaching assistant a few years ago and they decided to make me a science teacher for <laughs> class. And I was like, I would love it. It's great. It's such a great opportunity. And then um, I, so as well as the children learning, I was learning too. <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun. Um, I did like when I was teaching them about biology and stuff, I would like try to get them to understand it a bit better. So I used to play Grey's Anatomy's clip in the lesson so it's like if you if you cut an artery in your like neck or something this is what could happen <laughs> luckily one of the other teachers knew about it um, oh wow yeah. <laughs> I'd say you were popular yeah I think I was really good yeah <laughs> I loved it they're like oh yeah we get to watch them uh like blood and guff what age were the kids you were teaching yes three <laughs> <laughs> they were um so they were autistic so they were 12 to 18 which probably makes the story even worse because hey, hang on, you were showing autistic kids like glory <laughs> clips from Grey's Anatomy no, but it was the, like because loads of them they were just <laughs> oh I don't get it or whatever and I was like okay this will be really fun because there was like good music in the background and there were like things doing on the tv and stuff like they all understood what was going on was yeah good. and then another time I like created um like I drew a, a outline of some of like a te like someone in the classroom and then I did like paper mache organs of the human body and I got all the kids to place them on the yeah. outline of the body that was oh fun. wow that's a good yeah. idea I think my science teacher would be proud of me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that she'd be like look at how far she's come <laughs> have you heard this whole theory about how like there are some there's a group of people, scientists, I don't know, that believe that autism is the next step of evolution. Because you know how oh, they, a lot of these kids sense. have those like, they, well, what's it called? Savants? Is that what it is? When they have really good ability at something. So like the oh, ones yeah. that have really crazy photographic memory or that kind of stuff. They're saying like that's like a next level of intelligence in evolution and all this shit. Yeah, it's weird because like everyone is on the spectrum in one sense or another. Mm -hmm. um but I suppose because well I suppose the kids I was working with they had like speech and language issues as well or like motor skill problems too so like for a lot of high performing kids with autism it you could kind of see it in that sense but then there's a lot of issues surrounding like environment and social issues that means that that might have a lot of plot holes in yeah. that thing. I'm really good with all the academic chat <laughs> plot holes. Um, so while we're talking about plot holes and science knowledge, Dan, do you want to give us a very quick uh, reminder of your relationship with science? Uh, my relationship to science pretty much was summed up, not too dissimilar to Becky's, where I, know I wasn't in the bottom set, but I was in a mischievous set. So I never really got to grips with the whole learning malarkey. Um, and the teacher wasn't very good. Uh, okay, I don't want to say she wasn't very good. She had no authority in the class that needed it. So I didn't end up learning much and I got an E. And uh, now I decided instead of trying to learn, I'm going to use Huey's knowledge as my own. And here I am. Welcome. You're welcome. Did you guys meet before Dan got the E? <laughs> Who? Before I'm not Dan a drug dealer. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I said, did you guys meet before Dan got the E? No, way after. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Dan Ten got the E and then literally was like, I need to find a girlfriend who's good at science. And then he picked me. Yeah. And then he found Kiri. Well, I obviously did very well then. <laughs> um, 
Um, okay, cool. So should we actually move on to the science now? Yay! Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, just a quick warning. If you're someone who has who is sensitive to talking about personal bodily functions, this is not the paper for you because we are about to go deep, deep into detail. About ourselves. About oh, we're, going, we're going deep into ourselves. Is that what we're saying? Spoiler alert. We're going into the <laughs> Hey, there's the uh, there's the t- episode title. Yeah. We we're go. going deep into ourselves. Yep. Okay, right. right. So the title of this paper is a mountable toilet system for personalized health monitoring via the analysis of excreta. Alice, is it excreta or excreta? I would say excreta, but you'd, you'd, you'd get both. Yeah, okay. I'm going to stick I, with excreta. To be honest, it's not a term that I come across a lot. Uh, there's a lot of words in this paper that I've never seen until today. Yeah, so I, I might be able to help with some of them, but this sounds a bit more scientific than what I'm used to. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll say that again. It's a mountable toilet mm. system for personalised health monitoring via the an- analysis of excreta. Any initial thoughts on what this might be about? Toilets. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm getting a poo vibe. Yeah, poop. Excretion is like the di- the, like the end result. Mm-hmm. Okay, poo and toilets, you're not far off. Um, all right, so what this paper is. So we've done a few papers like this before. And it's basically, this is more about finding and describing a product that's being made rather than uh, discovering something that we already don't know. Um, so there's, have you guys heard of a field of medicine called precision medicine? No, I haven't. Oh, we just got upgraded. Oh, is it unlimited? Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Um, this podcast is sponsored by Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yes new sponsor <laughs> hey i've heard seems a bit problematic though yeah there's a lot of hacking going on yeah and i've heard there's lots of issues with privacy on like from their own terms and conditions and stuff ah uh, would everyone relax there's no need to be private but once you upgrade to zoom your zoom <laughs> premium membership you won't have any of those problems Zoom membership. <laughs> um right so precision medicine is basically um it's a way of uh tailoring medical approaches to someone Um, based on their environment, their lifestyle and their genes. So it's trying to be as precise as possible in how you treat someone based on who they are, what they do and what their DNA is like. Um, It's different to personalised medicine. It's basically the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So the only problem with precision medicine as it is now, it's that it's actually, it's very good for treating a disease but it's not very good for preventing and detecting an early disease because it's based on symptoms that have already appeared rather than predicting whether a symptom will appear or predicting whether something is going to lead to something. So there's now a sort of counter field that's developing called precision health. Um, And these precision health is trying to do the opposite thing. So through longitude and also long-term monitoring of uh, patients we can maybe predict if something's going to happen or just keep track of someone's health and prevent something from happening in the first place um so the analogy that this paper uses is from airplanes and jet crafts where jet craft engines have hundreds of sensors normally that will prevent engine failure um but so that's, that's what awesome they're, yeah so that's what they're trying to do Um, in humans but the problem is that this paper is based in the US the average adult in the US will only go to see their doctor four times a year hang on hang on can I just say so what they're trying to do is (coughs) invent a toilet that's going to prevent engine failure in a human exactly that's exactly (laughs) what they're trying to do excellent um yeah but yeah unfortunately adults only go to the GP four times a year and I'm sure it's not much higher in the UK. Um, Mel's, I don't know if you want to try and find like the actual stat for that. Um, so this surveillance of the human body is really, really limited per person and it's not enough basically. So we need to implement and we need to find ways of uh, including health, precision health strategies into our day-to-day lives in a non-invasive way. Um, and the best things that we have in our human bodies that can tell us anything about our state of health is breath, sweat, saliva, blood, urine, 
and stool, aka poo. Unfortunately, things like um, sweat and breath, because it's all external, it can be contaminated easily. So that's not a very good thing to be doing um, at home. And then with blood, people don't really want to be taking their own blood samples all the time. Um, silent demands a fact. The average in the average GP visits in the UK is just over five times a year. So it's actually not that different from the US. Um, the US once a year, four times a year. That's surprising because they have to pay. Yeah, but I suppose a lot of them have insurance. And gunshot and wounds. Don't. Yeah. And what did anyway. you say, Dan? And gunshot wounds. <laughs> I think they'd be going to the A and E, not to their GP, Dan. It's, it's, a, it's a normal thing. That's the problem. Oh. Ah, another one. Fuck's sake. Probably. Um. Okay. So there are routine medical tests that are done um, to check your urine and your stool and your blood and all that. Um, but now we want to see if maybe we can do this at home. So these guys, what they did is they wanted to find a way, they are now looking at smart toilets. So apparently smart toilets are already a thing and they've been, people have been trying to build smart toilets since the min, since the eighties. Um, and they're already, yeah. Have the Japanese not already built smart toilets? The, it is a Japanese company that are mostly building these smart toilets. <laughs> um, but it's not the smart toilets that clean your bum, you know? Although they're, the bidet toilets, oh. They're every, pretty smart toilets. Everyone fucking needs a bidet toilet. Like, you will never, your arsehole will never feel as clean as after you've used the bidet toilet. What a tagline. <laughs> it's true though. Like, honestly, when I was living with my sister and she has one of those toilets, and after, like, washing my bum hole with the bidet, uh, several times every time I went even when I peed I used to just do it just for fun and then when I moved out of my sister's place my bum hole just never felt as clean anymore it's very sad um <laughs> so small toilets I'm enjoying this <laughs> um but yeah feel free to interrupt me at any time now because we're actually going to go into what they did um so these smart toilets one of the latest products which had a patent was announced in 2008 but it's not very good for clinical use so it does take your temperature of your wee it um takes your body fat and your weight um but that's not actually very useful um and clinically in terms of trying to prevent disease um and it costs six thousand dollars so not very affordable oh. for the average person either so what these guys want to do is they want to make although with all the money that you're saving during lockdown, maybe you could afford one. That's true. That's true. What are you think... Go on. I haven't saved as much as I thought I would. I think I've been buying too much stuff. You told me you weren't buying anything. Oh. <laughs> she, she told me this the day after she sent me a screenshot of some coffee equipment that she bought, which was £65. Yeah, it's worth it though. I think you have like, you know, like body dysmorphia. You have like spending morphia. <laughs> I think I do. But I spend think with morphia. You don't realise you're even spending. But I will say now, if you don't have an aero press, you went and bought one. If you don't have an aero press, you should go get one because Yeah, but I, I only bought the one that cost twenty six pounds. Yeah, but I needed I've got set okay, so basically it's Caravan's fault because I got sent whole coffee beans by accident and I needed to buy a grinder as well. You had already ordered the grinder, don't lie. <laughs> no, it came with the AeroPress. Yeah, That's but you ordered so, it before you got sent the whole beans. Stop blaming Caravan. No, I didn't. So if you're if you're tr if you're tuning into this podcast, this is actually an intervention. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. The the beans came first. Sure. Anyway, whatever. I don't need to defend myself <laughs> to you, okay? Um. Right. Okay. So. This paper is called what we call a proof of concept paper. And a proof of concept paper is basically an introduction to a new idea or a new uh, hypothesis. And they're just showing that it works. Um, so before any sort of big research is done, you'll always need to do something proof of concept to prove that this is worth continuing on a bigger scale. That's what these guys have done with their toilet. Um, so they measured several things. And I want to give you a bit of a sneak peek into what they did, and then we'll go into more detail. So they had first standard urinalysis test strips. They also had video analysis of urine stream. 
this toilet could also take images of stool. It would, collect, it would collect information such as first stool dropping time and total seating time. Um, it would also then use a fingerprinting as a biometric method to identify the person. And it would also take anal prints. <laughs> we will go into anal, anal prints. Anal prints. How do you do an anal print? Special. We will go into this. <laughs> Oh, we're actually getting a uh, demonstration. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to bend over right now. Um, so, uh, how these guys did is they basically uh, developed a toilet seat and lid that had all these components in it. And all you need to do is just clip it onto an existing toilet like you would your normal toilet seat and then it's ready to go. Um, so the first part we're going to talk about is the urinalysis and that's basically looking at what's in your urine so things like your protein levels um your uh waste levels salt levels and all that kind of thing in your blood in your urine which is a really good way of testing how your health is at that moment especially things like the health of your kidneys um and these are really done easily at home with test strips you know those like dip things and like you know like when you're testing the composition of a fish water fish tank water and you dip it in and it changes colour depending on how much of something there is. Like the pH level thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So that's well what done. Dan, do you know what it's called? The pH level thing? Yeah, what are those little strips of paper called? That, that, that is my explanation of it. I don't know the actual name. Okay. Um, so I think I know. What is it, Alice? A litmus paper. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Well done. Um, right, so these strips are really good, but obviously they're colour, so you need to be able to look at it and judge what the colour is. Um, so how these guys did it is they tested this with two participants, a male and a female, both 39 years old, and they were just asked to pee and use pee into the toilet and use test strips whenever they needed, whenever they voided is the word they use. Um, and, ha and then through this, they used sort of, so the test strips were loaded onto this like deployer thing. They call it a deployer. And then when you pee, <laughs> it like whips out, you, it catches your piss and then it whips back in. The way they positioned this is they got a man to stand in front of the toilet and position himself as he was peeing. And then they would fake pee so that they knew exactly where to position this strip in the toilet bowl. <laughs> Um, he videoed himself while he was peeing. No, 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 no. This is just him like pretending to pee. Ah, oh. yeah. Um, then the when they start peeing, this is automatically detected with a motion sensor in the toilet, and then a test strip is automatically pushed out. It gets fully saturated with the wee, so this takes about thirty to sixty seconds, and then this test strip is then gone back in and it's monitored by a video camera. So this video camera will now monitor the test strip to see what's happening to the colors. And then using lights, different sorts of lights, um, the red, green, and blue uh, can be analyzed by these cameras to then tell you exactly what shade of color that the test strip has turned. Little nice note, they've also made the strips environmentally friendly and safe because they replaced the plastic with a water soluble material. So that's nice. That, that's nice. Uh, that's, that's a bit of wholesome, wholesome news. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was their first thing that they added to the toilet. Um, the second thing that they added, so there are there are these machines called Euroflowmeters. Euro Euroflowmeters, Euro flow, flow meters. And these are machines that they use in clinics and they calculate the amount of urine you pass, the flow rate, so the speed at which you pee and the length of time it takes you to pee and these can give you quite good um, measures on your general health as well um, so they did this they managed to make a video camera version of this Euroflowmeter using two high-speed cameras specifically speaking they used the GoPros they used two GoPros that were positioned inside the toilet and these would watch you pee um, so then what would happen is with this they used 
they asked 10 males to just pee using in this toilet and pee as normal. So then, and then they would use the urophilometer as well to compare how this would perform. And the, what would happen is the video would use different frames. So it could sort of, the two positions of the camera allowed them to see a 3D image of your pee as it's going into the toilet. And then it will also estimate how much the frames are overlapped. And then through that, it was able to, with some clever science and clever engineering, they can figure out how long it takes the pee, for you to pee, how fast you are peeing, and how much you are peeing. And then, wow. so then when they compare this to the normal measure of doing this, they actually found that it was 90, almost 96% accurate um, in actually giving you the same measures that it would through a normal machine, which is really, really good. Um, the only thing that was different, which, yes? What's the point? It's good for your health. <laughs> Why is measuring how fast you pee going for your health? Uh, I don't know what it tells. Maybe if your pee slows down, it indicates like a blockage or something. Okay. No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes I go to the toilet. Sometimes I push a bit harder than I need to. <laughs> yeah, if I, if sure. I'm in, no, you know, if, I, if I'm no, in the middle of an what? Xbox game, I need to rush back. And I'm like, I do that sometimes. Like sometimes I'll be peeing and then I'll like, I want to see how, how loud I can make my pee. So then I'll like <laughs> push extra hard. So I pee harder. There's always a classic if you go somewhere and you see a skid mark somewhere, you, you, you go for it. You know? <laughs> that's, a cla that's a classic male peeing technique though. So the way that Alice and Becky are looking at us right now, <laughs> it makes sense like you and me are going out down and not these two it all makes mm. a lot of sense <laughs> um, so silent demands are just found okay yeah so a, a slow or low flow rate might mean that there's an obstruction in the bladder or the urethra or an enlarged prostate or your bladder's getting weaker so that can give you signs of your health depending on how fast or slow your pee comes out um, the only difference between the video and the normal machine which makes the video better <laughs> so <laughs> the end phase of urination is called terminal dribbling <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more time sorry <laughs> terminal dribbling and i think we can okay. all imagine what that dribbling feels and looks like we've all been there we know those little bits that you have to shake off because <laughs> you finish with it um so the only difference is that this could the <laughs> this video computer aided um <clears throat> Thing that they've put in the toilet can actually measure the terminal dribbling as well whereas the normal machines that they use can't um, so that can actually be quite useful um okay right now we're on to the fun bit now we're on to poo um Yay. okay so do you guys know what the bristol stool chart is mm. it's color and um no <laughs> is it so it's another color? go Give it another go. You're kind of on the right track. Is it the colour and like the um, texture? That it, yeah, like how thick and everything else is. Thick. How? Not so much colour, more along the other track. So like, if it's up, like normal, hard, or oh, we've lost a Was oh. it because of my? <laughs> 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 you got so frustrated with your shitty description. <laughs> no, shit description. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you because I have the Bristol stool chart on my Ooh. right now. So. You said that as though we're supposed to be really excited because this is an exclusive thing that you're going to share with us. It is. I, I have a morgue with the Bristol stool form scale on it. <laughs> well, it's not mine, but it's in the department. Uh, okay, can you see my screen? Sure can. Okay. You shouldn't have tabs like that open. Jesus Christ. So this is the Bristol stool chart. So what this is, is this is used to measure the size and shape and consistency oh boy. of your poo. Um, I'm going to have sausage later as well. I probably won't know. And it can tell you a lot about your state of your digestive health. So the, this type one and type two, which is described as separate hard lumps, you know, like those rabbit dropping poos you sometimes have when you're really constipated. Um, those ones, type two is lumpy and sausage like, and these type one and type two are considered on the constipated side. And then type three to five is more normal. 
And then type five to seven is... Uh, sorry, can we? Can you uh, still read out what three and four description is, please? Okay, sorry. For the people so, at home. So type three is a sausage shape with cracks in the surface. I feel like <laughs> this one, it might be one of those, like, you know those ones that kind of hurt when they come out? Like, they're a bit spiky. Mm. No, that's not supposed to be like that. Oh, is that like uh -oh. two? No, type two would be the one that's kind of spiky. Oh, uh, okay. Um, type four is like a smooth, soft sausage or snake. I often get my sausages and snakes confused. <laughs> uh, type five is soft blobs with clear cut edges. And this is when you're starting to lack fibre, but it's still normal. Uh, type six is a mushy consistency with ragged edges. Uh, this is mild diarrhea. And then type seven is, I also like, is also not brown in the picture anymore. It's more yellow. Again, I think we've all been there. Uh, this is a liquid consistency with no solid pieces or severe diarrhea. I have, to, six, I, have to, I have to talk to people about this every day, <laughs> but I still don't like hearing those descriptions read out loud. <laughs> they're not good, are they? No, they're, they're vile. Type six sounds like a description of me as a person. What was type six again? <laughs> Mushy consistency with ragged edges. You know what? <laughs> that's not far off. <laughs> Oh my god, Dan, that's deep. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So, um, so this Bristol stool chart, it's widely used, and it's kind of Alice, correct me, jump in at any point if I'm wrong at this point, but it's kind of the only one of the only ways at the moment that we can sort of assess digestive health through the appearance of your stool alone. Um, the problem with this is is that obviously it's very subjective so it depends who's looking at it and what you think that it's closest to um so people that are so doctors who are specialized in sort of colorectal health they are considered the gold standard of the type of people that can tell you which stool it is um and the and the patients themselves often vary a lot in what they're saying um so what they did with this is hang on a minute so with this one they now used machine learning so this is where they basically had they created this sort of algorithm where they showed this uh they showed it hundreds and hundreds of images of different types of poo they would then classify them and tell the machine what classification of poo it is and then from that the machine would then learn that this sort of poo is type one this is type seven blah 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 so then what they did is they got two um gold standard surgeons to come in and be the sort of expert opinion on what people's poos were and then they got some others to come in now this paper has some really great figures for us um, i'm just going to show you one now uh, this is the first paper I've ever seen, which has a picture of an actual poo in these figures. <laughs> and this looks like a cracking poo. If I were, did that, I'd be quite happy with myself. So what would happen is with this toilet, you would take a shit and then it would take pictures of the poo you're doing. And then it would pump this picture through this machine. And basically it found that this, um, when they compared what, the medic what some untrained medical students were saying were rating the poos and compared to what the machine was rating the poos, the machine was rating the poos much closer to what these gold standard surgeons were rating the poos. So basically what they're saying is that this toilet is much better at rating, um, at giving accurate Bristol stool um, classifications compared to even medically trained students who would maybe more clinically, uh, clinically, maybe better yeah clinically trained or have more of a clinical eye to be able to make decisions about this sort of thing um so then uh so then it goes on to defecation monitoring now this is looking at more of things other than the shape and size and color of your poo um so how this worked is it wanted to measure several things so one of them is that they put a pressure sensor into the seat so this would measure for the moment you sit down it would be able to tell you when you started pooing and then it would then measure how long it takes you to finish the poo. So for example, if you were suddenly on the toilet for a lot longer and it was giving you longer readings, then you might think that this person is now starting to be constipated. Once this pressure is felt and it's like, cool, the pressure's on, this person is now taking a shit, um, it would switch on an LED light inside the toilet bowl 
so that the lighting conditions in the toilet is always the same for any pictures and videos that are now being taken. Which I was that like, was imagine if you go to the toilet in the middle of the night, right? And then it's, you know when it's dark and you don't really want to wake up, so you kind of sit there and pee with your eyes slightly closed. Yep. Can you imagine if you sit down and then suddenly your toilet's glowing? <laughs> it would be like a sign, like, this is your destination. Exactly. <laughs> for some reason, I feel like it would make you feel like E.T. Yeah. <laughs> you know like he touches things and they glow oh true, true. <laughs> or or like michael jackson in the thriller video true yeah is it thriller? no that's been a gene i think oh yeah you're right so yeah they they basically start recording a video of the toilet um and it will record toilet use and after this um after this is finished after you set up and the toilet's like cool the pressure sensor's not being triggered anymore this person's finished the images will be sent to um this uh the machine learning and basically it can it distinguishes between three states of the toilet and this can then give us more measurements so it will measure when the toilet is clean when it's just urine when it's stool or toilet paper so by through this machine learning they can determine the first poo the first stool dropping so that will measure how long it takes between you sitting down to then your first shit coming out. Um, it can also measure how long it takes you to poo. And this is calculated by the first stool when it's in the stool state. And then when it goes into toilet paper state, they're like, cool, that's how long it's taking you to actually poo. Um, so this is also a weird thing as well. So it will also say that you've ended your poo when it either goes to toilet paper state or when it realizes that there is no more pressure on the toilet for more than 30 seconds. Now, seconds is a long time. It is, but also they're saying that they assumed that the use of toilet paper or standing up indicates that the user is finished. It doesn't take 30 seconds to wipe your ass, right? Mm, that's that's debatable. So, what dirty fucker is taking a shit? And then not wiping. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, and we've all got different assholes, and we all poo different textures, you know. So it's, it's, it's a, this is why the studies are here, you know. Oh, uh, here, here's a poll for you though, because I found out that some people do this. Before you wipe, do you wipe sitting down or do you stand up first? Sitting down. Yeah, sit down. Sitting oh wait, so, sometimes I, mean, I stand up. You stand up before you wipe. No, what? To wipe. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> like, to what degree to what degree you're standing up like i lean forward yeah yeah that's okay I don't my knee my knees are bent when i'm wiping i don't back. i like i hate the idea of like my hand catching the back of the toilet seat so sometimes i just do that mm. so i think it's okay if you're still bent over dan and i personally know someone who will stand who used to stand up fully before wiping and i thought oh, that was really fucking weird Oh, I no. need to get access to the area you need to get access to. Exactly. And then also, I was like, and once your arse cheeks close, what if any yeah. like, residue shit gets like spread around, you know? Ew. I don't do that. Okay. I just sometimes just like a standing squat, like teapot. Yeah. Kind of like yeah. a lean board. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, cool. So it can measure all these things from this video, just from filming what's happening inside the toilet. Um, so then. The way they tested how accurate this was is they recruited 11 participants, five females and six males, and they asked them to use this toilet over five weeks. Um, so from this, the participants' first stool dropping time, defecation duration, seating time, and their Bristol stool information was gathered. But I thought this was weird. Only two out of the 11 research participants were happy to grade their own stool on the Bristol stool chart. Which means nine out of the, these 11 participants didn't want to look at their poo. Which I, thought was, I thought that was really weird. That's really weird. Mm. Yeah. Does everyone not look at their poo? I always look at my poo. Yeah. <laughs> always. And also... Well, I, I, go on. Go on. <laughs> I, I always say, uh, you know, crack a little hole open between my legs and have a look, you know. If I've got my phone, I'll start the torch in there. To get a Wait, hang look. on. You look between your legs. Why don't you just stand up and look? Well, I don't want the poo spread in between my cheeks. I don't want to be... <laughs> That's true. Sometimes I do miss what my poo looks like because there's tissue on it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you, you need to have a look before the uh, toilet paper uh, affects it. But also what I thought was weird about these people is, one, they didn't want to look at their poo, but they're happy for these strangers to look at their poo and analyse it. Yeah, but I, I kind of agree. I was in a similar scenario one time and it's different having someone else do... 
it's rather a different doing something with someone else's poo than it is doing it with your own poo. Let me put it that way. Yeah, I suppose. Okay. It's just something not right. Yeah. But but I don't like I don't really understand not looking at it though. I mean neither. It's like, mm, mm. So do you look at your poo? Yeah. No. She's not hyping either. Probably not she's, even she's, she's shy. No. I reckon I reckon most people look at their poo. But somehow this study managed to find nine people out of 11 who didn't want to look at their own poo. Uh, do you still, because sometimes you have a poo and you know it's, it's a crap poo. Do you still take a look? Yeah. Or do, okay, interesting. What do you mean? And also, um, Dan, do you not look because you don't want to be disappointed in yourself? <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes they like, you like pop out a couple of pebbles and I'm like, oh, that's not worth the time and effort. I'd rather just wipe and just be, got, be over with. Yeah, I understand. Oh, yeah, but when it feels like pebbles, sometimes I still want to see to see if it's bigger than it felt. But it never is. No. Hmm. Um, Kerry, um, again, and not to be cynical or anything, but do they uh, indicate how they're measuring health? Mm, what do you mean? Like, are they, does it compare poos and then alert you when your poo changes so it hasn't actually gone that far so at the moment i think with this paper they're just testing if this works okay so it's like looking at a drug and seeing if it's if it's yeah so they're saying exactly so they're saying is this actually a feasible way to monitor health um in the future and they do sort of hints at the end that this would be something that you would become a normal part of your daily routine and they would collect lots of data over time. So then it would start. Well, obviously, you go to the toilet every day. Well, not every day. <laughs> well, you, you would at least pee every day, I hope, or else you're drier than the Sahara Desert. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so then if it measures you long term, then it can see if things start to change. And then at that point, you can call, kind of be like, something's going wrong, something's not right. Um, okay, finally. Now, a really important issue in today's society is all about privacy and data protection um, and they're saying one of the biggest drawbacks and roadblocks that these sorts of smart toilets have been facing is that um, people are concerned about their data um, so this is where the fingerprint scanner comes in so what these guys did is they 3d printed a flush handle that has a fingerprint scanner on it so as soon as you've done your business you'll scan your mm. you'll scan your fingerprint on there and then it will know to tag all the data that's been collected as this user. And then that takes it on. Clever. Yeah. The, the only thing okay. is that they've had, sorry. Yeah. Go on, Dan. Uh, my thing with that is like, what, what if uh, Barry, he's gone in before me, uh -huh. I, as I noticed, he's got a little bit of poop on his finger. He puts it on the fat scanner. So when I go to flush next time, I'm like, oh, the fingerprint flushed is dirty. Oh, that's a bad idea. So, uh, <laughs> a, a, yes, then they've named two limitations of the fingerprint scanner. You've now given us a third one that there might be someone else's shit on it. Yep. Um, the, uh, their issue is that someone other than the user might flush the toilet, which I thought was really fucking weird. Like, who is yeah, in the toilet with you that they're flushing it? Um, also, <laughs> lots, of, lots of toilets have automatic flushes now. Um, so that would take that away. And then also, um, in places like Asia, a lot of them have squatting toilets, um, where the flush is normally on the floor. So this wouldn't work. So they've come up with another identification method, which utilizes an anal print. So did you know, did you know that the creases of your internet, uh, well, your internet, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> did you know that the creases of your arsehole are as unique to you as your fingerprint oh i never i've never checked but no i know yeah fascinating many a men have said that to me <laughs> <laughs> so um what they did is that they actually installed a scanner into the toilet that would record a short video clip of the user's anus and then from this, it would be able to sort of, as you would your fingerprint, it would create an anal print. And from now on, it would always be able to figure out if it was you using the toilet, just from you sitting on it and seeing the anus that comes on it. Um, they tested this with 11 participants um, and they actually found that this was very, very accurate um, and it worked really, really well. 
Uh, I'm also now going to share my screen with you again, just to show you how it works. And I'm going to post this on the Twitter and Instagram as well, because again, I've never seen a paper where they've put in actual arseholes. Oh, oh God. <laughs> oh, wow. Can you zoom in a bit there? That's, uh... So right <laughs> down the barrel of a gun. Oh, <laughs> wow, look at all the look at all those different assholes. So on oh this God, paper, so wrinkly. This one's really weird. Ooh. So, so when your lips go really dry. I think this guy's got piles. Yeah. Um, so on my screen, which I might post on Twitter. I'm not Instagram wouldn't let me post this, but I'll post it on Twitter. <laughs> is we have ten images of ten different assholes. And as you can see, they are all very different. So from this, you'd be able to get your unique anal prints for each person, and that's how they're doing it. Like, it's not that different, really, from looking at pictures of vaginas, but it's so much worse for some reason. Because you know shit comes out of it. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's the paper. And just to finish off, they did a quick survey of... Um, from 300 people uh, just to get their opinions on the toilet and, and I don't know if you'd agree or disagree with what they found but basically they found that um, only 37% of people were somewhat comfortable with using this, 15% were very comfortable and 30% of the participants said they would feel uncomfortable using this toilet um, and it wasn't because of the pictures and the videos it was more because of their own privacy protection. Um, and they were concerned about how good the data security would actually be on a toilet. Um, of GDPR. Exactly. Uh, the most accepted test that they found was the urinalysis, so the test strips of your pee. Um, the least favoured test on this, can anyone guess? The RSL pictures. Yeah, was the mm. anal prints. They were not happy with the anal prints. Um, this isn't my arsehole. Can't be. <laughs> So, yeah, that's that. Um, their main takeaway is that this is definitely could be something that's used in the future if they can find a way to make it cheaper. Um, and all they need to really develop now is a self-cleaning mechanism so that the toilet can always be sterile. Ooh. Okay, interesting. Crazy. So, I mean, I mean it's, it hasn't got me wanting to rush out and buy a $6,000 toilet to be honest this one isn't six thousand dollars they're trying to make it cheaper than the six thousand dollar one. Oh, okay okay um i mean again it's not something that i am rushing to get installed in my house yeah uh, but it'd be interesting it'd be interesting again i'm maybe potentially uncomfortable with the whole arsehole picture thing why um i why? just don't know if i want because it, it's going to be it's going to be stored somewhere this is on someone's cloud what if someone accidentally opens my Documents and they go, oh, Dan, it's your arsehole. Yeah, but like, arseholes aren't sexy, you know? Well, what if I do have a sexy arsehole? Someone, oh, like, oh. someone out there has an arsehole fetish. What do you mean, someone? There's definitely a whole website for it. Probably. Oh, yeah, I think there's probably a lot. Imagine a date leak. Leakedarseholes.com. Oh, or leaky arseholes. <laughs> like, there was coronavirus <laughs> porn, there's definitely going to be arsehole fetishes. <laughs> That's true. Mm. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to getting it or to using it mm -hmm. you just want to know what's going on inside of you yeah so I think it'd be quite cool yeah mm -hmm. me too yeah it's like with those weights or those scales where you mm. stood on it and then it would tell you your BMI and everything else yeah and like the star sign and stuff That's yeah cool. <laughs> I think it's quite nice as well we're in like era of people we want more and more information about ourselves and like we are obsessed but obsessed with collecting data yeah like with mm. and stuff is what's the what's the what's the next what, what would be the next household appliance that we'd use to find out about ourselves more the toilet duh i just spent like 40 minutes talking about it well <laughs> yeah no i mean but but after after the toilet what's the next is it like a pillow that when you sleep it just scans your brain no, because they have that already with like different apps and stuff. Or like they do like when you're, yeah, would you want to get a, a app that looks into your dreams? Would that be like Inception? Whoa. That would be sick. It'd be very Inception. Oh my God, I'd love that. I read that article today about all the fucked up dreams people are having in lockdown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I am. My, dream, my dreams are crazy right now. Yeah. Mine are so vivid. Yeah. They feel like actual movies going on in my head. Yeah. You know this morning where... 
I'm sorry, not this morning, earlier when you were talking about, um, oh, what did you mention? That reminds me of it. Oh, like the way people only go to their doctors four times a year or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one of my dreams was like, like, you know, sometimes you have dreams and you just know things about the dream. So like yeah. in the dream, we all had to go for this yearly test. And it was a blood, urine and stool test. And everyone had to do it once a year. I tried to take my own blood and weird stuff happened. And blood started coming out of me without me actually putting the needle in. Ooh. And then my arm started getting sore in the dream. And then when I woke up, my arm was still sore <sighs> in my life. How so weird is that? I had a dream that I was cycling down to South London where my parents live because I haven't seen them since all of this happened. So I was cycling down there and I woke up and I was in hospital and they and then all these doctors and nurses were there and they were just like, you have the virus, so you have to stay in this hospital now. And um, it was like where I was like, my dream was like half an hour away from where my parents are. And I think it was more that, like, I was really close to being at home and got the virus. Oh, oh no. It was very real. Has Dude. it put you off going home? I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure I dreamt I was a superhero last night. I don't know what. Um, no. No, it's just a bit of a faff to get to the lull. It's taking too long. The confidence is building. Oh, my internet's... Yeah, Carrie's frozen again. Did I break Kiri with my story? I think you might have. <laughs> Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Dan, yes. what was your superpower? Uh, I, I, was, I think I was like a Batman-esque um, person, but I can't to reveal my identity. What would you say? Oh, Kiri is having technical difficulties, I believe. Am I here? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I've gotten in, in and out. Hello. Right, check one, two, one, two. Hello. Yeah. Kiri cannot hear us. Well, she can hear us. Okay. Hello. Hang on. Yeah? I can hear you. Kiri, wave at the camera if you can hear us. You need to wave. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think okay. you're back. Uh, okay. I'm so glad this happened after the paper. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I know, yeah. Okay, should we try wrap it up in case this keeps happening? I think she's delayed as well. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely delayed. <laughs> okay, right. Um, do you guys have any final questions? Uh, although Kerry has told me to ask that, but I won't be able to answer them because I didn't do the paper. So, um, hey, any I final questions? Yeah. Oh, no, she's gone again. Okay, um, any final questions? I'll pass them on to Kerry and she'll email you. Uh, no, I thought it was a very, very interesting paper. Um, I saw it, you know, in toilets is advancing a good rate. Yeah, crucial. Yeah, yeah crucial. I found that really interesting body. too. Um, <laughs> Do you guys feel like you learned new things? I feel like I saw a lot of <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy that I don't know that each person has an individual arsehole. Yeah, you, you know, I think that's the big take home like, message. I, you could make it out like on a Valentine's card, like you're one in a million, just an arsehole. <laughs> Yeah. You know what? I see, a, I see a future for our health themed <laughs> romantic yeah. merchandise. I really do. In a scan, you can get that printed onto a t-shirt or something. Yeah, and also, um, so Kiri just said, imagine if anal prints were the new way to get on your phone. So you know how it's like facial recognition, <laughs> if the next big yeah. thing was anal recognition. I suppose as well, if, you know, I was about to say you could like solve crimes with it, but that would have to be a very specific crime. I yeah, and they'd have to have been naked at some point yeah. during the crime, or at least have the trousers on. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, I'm just thinking of like petty crime <laughs> being committed by like me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that is the paper. Um, um, you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at uh, uh, We love to hear from you, all our fans. Um, if you want more info on ourselves, you can. Future. Hello. Yeah. It's too late. We don't need you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hang on. Did you see what I said about chocolate assholes? Yeah, we talked about that. You're so behind. Oh, did you see what I said? That there's definitely criminals out there leaving ass prints. <laughs> no, but you've said it now. So I've already done the socials. <laughs> uh, okay, should I? Sit down? I'm hungry. 
I'm hungry and I want to go make dinner. So okay. uh, <laughs> bye. Thanks, Becky. Right. Thanks, Dan. Sure, he's gone again. Oh no, she's back. Oh, there's Dan. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna go now. Yeah, I'm so bad tonight. Fucking hell. Okay, I'm gonna take the selfie that I'm not gonna post.